So, uh, a Neolithic or domestic economy, the ideas of the goods are produced where they are consumed within the household uh, level. In, uh, in an urban or town economy, because of surpluses, uh, the idea is uh, that you have uh, consumers who are not necessarily producers, so you have a lot of like, people in between. Uh, and then in an industrial or national economy, the goods are produced in one part of the country and can be consumed in another part of the country. And of course, the next stage, you could say the global economy, where the goods are produced in one country and then consumed in another. Uh, so that's a very neat kind of evolutionary scheme, uh, if you like. Uh, and this is coming back this is earlier than Gordon Scheid. It came back from um, uh, primitive economics from people like, uh, like Karl Bücher and others. Uh, but uh, but I just wanted to show you this on, on this uh, mid scale also from uh, Ian Morris' book uh, from 2010, West Falls for now, because I mean you can see I think these stories are still working this sort of, uh, of, of concept. Okay, so as I said, I've been trying to trace where where this concept of neolithic evolution came from uh, through Gordon Schall's early writing, uh, early writings, and you have to think that. In 1925, he was about 30. Uh, by the time 1936, he was about 40. So we are talking about the early career of Gorkshire. And these are only some of the books that he published in that period. Uh, so he was immensely productive, as you, as you all know. Uh, and I was curious in how many times specific words actually appear in this, uh, in this synthesis. It's very easy to search now because all these books have been digitized. And um, it's very interesting because uh, starting with the dawn of European civilization, it's all about civilization. There's a little bit about, uh, well, there's quite a lot of fact about agriculture and Neolithic, but you see the word Neolithic barely appears in that, in that synthesis. And it's only in the 1930s, uh, I think that you really see the term revolution is then becoming like super important. Uh, so, uh, so when we think of Gordon Schild, Often described as a Marxist, but he was many things. He was he was uh, a migrationist in the Aryans. He was a diffusionist in the Danubian prehistory, and he was certainly certainly a functionalist in uh, Man Makes Himself, uh, where he took a lot of his ideas from Malinowski. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight here some some interesting citations from both. Uh, so some of my words are his. Uh, so, in Man Makes Himself, he says, Thus, Neolithic times may mean anything between 6000 BC and AD 1800, which is very interesting. So, what is he talking about? He's presumably talking about the arrival of uh, first settlers in Australia and New Zealand. He's probably talking about this industrially produced goods that are sort of being introduced uh, in these regions sort of polluting the local uh, economies. Um, and I also want to stress one thing, which is here, uh, in these two citations, in fact, he says uh, the word Neolithic is being used as the uncapitalized adjective Neolithic. So it's not as we use it today. Today we use it more as a, uh, as a label for a specific culture, a specific time period. But here it was an uncapitalized adjective, as in the French tradition, and why is that? Because probably his idea was that it was a universal scale of production for something that you could observe on a, on a sort of global scale. So it's not just about the Near East, not just about Europe. Uh, the idea was, uh, you can see that on a global level. Uh, okay. If you if you read uh, Man Makes Himself closely, uh, you might have noticed something really interesting, uh, which is that he, he gives some guidances some guidance on books. It says, if you're interested in Neolithic economics, you have to read these guys. Uh, and, and so these guys are, are uh, ethnographers. Uh, so uh, people like Raymond First, Primitive Economics of the New Zealand Maori, or uh, Turnbull, Austrian Economics of Primitive Communities, and of course Malinowski, Argonauts of the Western Pacific, and Coral Gardens and their magic. So it is interesting, it's not referring to the archaeological literature so much, but he's referring more to the uh, ethnographic uh, literature. Uh, so uh, here's one of these wonderful uh, 
images of Bolislav Malinowski. Uh, so I just have to say Malinowski was born that part of, uh, in, that, in that part of Poland that was part of the uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. And he moved to London. He was at the London School of Economics. So he was actually very close to where Bogenschild was. Because uh, Bogenschild, uh, in the 1920s, he was uh, the librarian of the Royal Anthropological Institute uh, in London. So, so they were working closely together. They were probably teaching classes uh, next to his parents. So, uh, and Malinowski uh, is, of course, very it's remembered today as one of the founding figures of uh, modern uh, social anthropology in Britain and uh, everywhere else, I would say. Uh, and, uh, and he's especially remembered for his work on his new fieldwork methods, like here, you can see participant observation. Uh, and what is quite interesting, I and mean, often Malinowski, we, people talk about the Kula exchange ring, uh, rings and so on. But here, I mean, he's also working with uh, communities that are uh, small scale farmers. Uh, that have uh, pottery, uh, and uh, so in effect, I think Gordon Schell was his idea was that he was working on something similar as Malinowski. They were working on similar topics. Uh, so here's a famous picture of Gordon Schell at uh, Scarabay. Uh, so Gordon Schell, I should say, has done the exact opposite of Malinowski. So Malinowski went all the way to the Pacific to do his real work. Gordon Schell was born in Australia to, to British parents, uh, and he moved to Europe to look at the origins of European civilization uh, by digging. Uh, but I think, in effect, his idea was that he was working on a similar topic as, as, uh, as Malinowski. Um, so just one other thing which was interesting for Gordon Schell is uh, the work of Raymond Furst on uh, cycles of acculturation. Uh, because that influenced many aspects of his writing as well about the introduction of uh, metallurgy, for instance, uh, in Europe and other things. Uh, and Raymond first was working with Malinowski, so you can trace this uh, uh, strand, I think, with uh, sort of primitive economics. Uh, and, uh, and the idea of, uh, of Raymond first, uh, you can see the cycle of acculturation, is here the Maori. They uh, become familiar with muskets, and they immediately they are like, "Wow, this is amazing! We want to have muskets as well. So how can we get muskets?" So to get muskets, we uh, what they need to do is they need to change their production. They need to produce goods that they can exchange, uh, and uh, to get these uh, muskets. And the idea is in the last uh, in the last uh, phase of that transition, uh, they. Uh, I mean, their, their institutions, their religious institutions, and so on, changed because the, the mode of production has changed. Uh, so I think this was very important, and we tend to forget this about uh, about uh, the other aspect, which was also coming from anthropology, social anthropology, as we we'll call it today, uh, is uh, the method of culture cycles. But this is something different. Uh, so I, I not confuse the uh, the uh, Cycles of acculturation and the method of culture cycles, uh, which is uh, Goldschild's translation. It's a very interesting translation of the word uh, Kulturkreisleben uh, that you have in Germany and in Austria. And so here, this is talking about something that was uh, in the, the 1920s, 1930s, happening, especially in Austria, in, in Germany, uh, which was a form of diffusionism that was pursued. And uh, it came back from, to this particular person here, Fritz Krebner, who was German, who moved to Austria, so that he could conduct uh, field work also in places like uh, the Western Pacific, because there was funding to, to do this expedition in, in Austria. And he published this very important book called Methode de l'Ethnologie in 1911. And, and I mean, the way, I mean, literally it's like, culture barriers or culture uh, circles. Uh, but uh, I, I've tried to understand exactly what it was about, very complicated as well. Uh, but um, I think David Clark, uh, in his book, Analytical Archaeology, he has a representation of it. He calls it a bit different. He calls it radio cultural theory. Uh, and the idea is that today you see those uh, cycles and you see some interaction between the cycles, some overlap. 
so what you can do is because as archaeologists we have access to uh, space form but we also have access to time time is very important as archaeologists we are extremely well placed to trace those uh, circles back in time and we can try to see those uh, primitive circles we can, we can trace them to different parts of the world. This was the idea of the diffusionist uh, school in Austria. Uh, so one example is uh, Oswald Menkin uh, working on Belgische Schnitte seit 1931. I mean, this is completely crazy to say, but the idea was there are three primitive uh, centers in the world. Uh, one is focused on blade, another one is focused on bone, and another one is focused on hand axis. And they interact, uh, so you have some overlap over time. Uh, but the idea is that they are coming from different places, so blades are coming from Europe, uh, I think bones are coming from Asia, and hand axis from Africa, and you can trace them uh, in, uh, in space. And this was a kind of alternative to the 3-8 three, uh, three, uh, system that was in place so the evolutionist kind of scheme uh, that you had with Christian Jürgens and Thompson and people like Gabriel de Mortier, Gabriel de Mortier had uh, described for Western Europe this really neat uh, evolutionary sequence from Chelea, Colea, Mousteria, Solitria, Magdalenia. And that works really well for Western France, uh, for Western uh, Europe, but it doesn't work so well for Eastern Europe and so on. Uh, so, uh, so what happened, and this is interesting, is uh, in Britain, uh, there's a man called William Rivers, uh, another very important figure of uh, social anthropology, uh, who is um, remembered today especially for his work on the genealogical uh, methods, so the development of kinship studies, very largely due to, uh, to Rivers. Uh, but uh, Rivers, late, later in his life, he had a sort of uh, like crisis of faith. He went to, he went to, uh, to, uh, this book, The History of Melanesian Society. And somehow, I think he met, uh, met Fritz Gretner on the way, and he became familiar with that book, Methode de Ethnologie, and he completely changed his volume. He completely changed his book, uh, and it became something diffusionist. So he moved from evolutionism to diffusionism. And he was one of the founding figures, together with Captain Elliot Smith, of the British School of Diffusionism. And uh, Rivers uh, died very early, died in 1922. Uh, so in fact, he was not so involved in that development. Uh, but it was later taken on by people like uh, William Derry. And I want to show you this one from that, I love it. Uh, from the growth of uh, civilization. Uh, Golden Child, by the way, was involved in uh, the preparation of the second edition of that book. So we know that he was familiar with his ideas and he was teaching, he was working with Derry and Get Smith and so on. And so uh, here, I think you see really what Gordon well, Shannon had in mind, which is you have uh, sort of like early centers somewhere in the Mediterranean, Middle East, and so on, and you have a worldwide kind of dispersal of agriculture, food producers, uh, and uh, you have really neat boundaries between food gatherers and food producers. So entire continent, you see food in Australia, it's like all food gatherers. So I don't really know exactly what time scale is supposed to be described, yeah? but, uh, but I think this is a sort of mindset that people had uh, at that time. And I, I also call this, I apologize uh, to Australia, but I call it the Australian connection because Crafton Elliot Smith, who was the other important figure of the British School of Fusionism, he was also from Australia. And, uh, and you see, he said things like the food gas was lived mainly on the outskirts of the world, far from great center of civilization. In some cases, they occupied countries such as Australia. And Gordon Shell actually acknowledged this, uh, what he owes to uh, Elliot Smith, so he says, for instance, so in 1925, adopting an idea advanced by Elliot Smith 10 years earlier, I selected food production as distinguishing the Neolithic from the earlier Paleolithic and Mesolithic. Uh, but I think, I, I would say this is not completely true. I think he was more interested in the ideas from Central Europe, from Beijing and others, but somehow, yes, I think he was still working on this. And now, uh, I just want to finish by saying when we, when we look at uh, Neolithic transition today, Neolithic expansion, uh, I mean, yes, to some extent, yes, we are still working on the paradigm that was set by 
for the child, I agree, but on the other hand, there are some differences. So I already mentioned that we are not working with the Neolithic, uncapitalized executive Neolithic, that is a global kind of like scale of production. Also, one very important difference is that today we tend to think of the Neolithic as two things, as the origins of agriculture and the spread of agriculture as two distinct things. But when you read Gorbachev's Man Makes Himself, um, you notice that he's talking about the Neolithic Revolution actually spreading. The Neolithic Revolution is actively moving across the entire world. It's not actually uh, tied to uh, only the Middle East and, and, and so on. And uh, with this, I, I thank you. And this is a paper I covered a couple of years ago uh, on Gorbachev, if you're interested. Uh, and I really want to thank my colleague Katie Mayer uh, from the Institute of Archaeology in London, who and she knows far more than I do about Wolfshad, so I, I really want to thank her because she's always sending me information. Thank you.